as Chancellor of the University, I declare this congregation open for the conferring of degrees by the authority of the Senate and the Council. My Lord Mayor, civic dig dignitaries, parents, relatives, friends, and graduands, as Vice Chancellor, I am delighted to welcome you all to this degree congregation. It is a celebration for all those who graduate today. We celebrate your major achievements that culminate in a degree from a major international research and teaching-led university. While you have been with us, the university has developed and changed. We are now a community of 19,500 students and 3,000 staff with a turnover of £158 million. It all demonstrates that universities are complex organisations. We engage in a range of activities. First, the development of our campus to support high quality research high quality teaching and a high quality student experience. This year, we completed our mathematical modeling and space science building, which we will officially open and name after our chancellor this autumn. We have refurbished laboratories for chemistry and for archeology. span And we will take over this summer a new 20 million pound biomedical building. Secondly, we have started a systematic fundraising campaign with three landmark projects. First, a world-class library for which we have already raised 16 million pounds against a target of 25 million. Secondly, a cardiovascular research institute for which we have raised all but two million pounds for a 20 million pound project. In addition, we are also seeking funding for a range of senior academic positions, as in my view, staff are the key to a high quality university. If you can help us, or you know someone who can, please do not hesitate to talk to me at the end of this ceremony. Thirdly, we continue to develop high quality research. In the Faculty of Medicine and Biological Sciences this year, we have witnessed a major award to Professor Nilish Zamani from the British Heart Foundation, demonstrating that Leicester leads in the field of cardiovascular research. In genetics, we were delighted as Sir Alec Jeffries received yet another award, but this time a very significant award by being given the Louis Jante uh, prize for very distinguished work in the field of genetics. This adds to the range of work that Alec Jeffries has contributed in this university over many years. These are just a small number of examples of the research activity of this university. The list is endless and indeed demonstrates the power of the research enterprise that drives our teaching. Teaching is as important as research, and the two lock together. This year, I am delighted to be able to announce that Dr. Derek Rain in our physics department was awarded a National Teaching Fellowship. Currently, there are special projects in medicine and in physics that involve investigations on teaching methods and curricula, as well as new initiatives in genetics education and geographical information systems. Fifthly, is our contribution to the community through a range of cultural activity. Our work with schools, teachers, pupils, and parents in the inner city is conducted with a view to broadening access into higher education, not only into this university, but to universities across the country. But most importantly, in my view, is the voluntary work that is done by our students during the course of the year through a student union organization called Contact. This year, 540 students of this university have helped children in primary schools to learn to read. They have organized events for disabled pupils. They have led holidays for children who would otherwise not get one. 
those pupils will never forget the voluntary help they received. To teach a child to read is to empower them. It changes their lives. And we are very proud of the work of Leicester graduates in contributing to the city and to the county. In addition, much goes on in the university's botanic garden, which contributes to the educational and cultural work which occurs within in the city and the county. This year, the garden features our third international sculpture exhibition. The exhibition runs until mid-September, and I, will, I hope that those of you who are visiting Leicester this week will take the opportunity to visit the gardens. Now, in any organisation, change is inevitable. But in developing change, we need to build on activities where we are already excellent. In Leicester, it will mean using our expertise in research and, and teaching by, firstly, establishing further strategic alliances with higher and further education institutions. We already have a Colleges University of Leicester network that comprises 24 institutions from the west of Birmingham through to Scunthorpe. And we have developed a special partnership with Bishop Grossetest College in Lincoln and Newman College in Birmingham, whose courses we validate and with whom we work. Secondly, we can contribute to the development of professional education through medicine, through law, through social work, and through teacher training. It is very important that the university continues to make a, re a contribution to the work that our graduates of today will do in successive years. And I hope many of you will wish to return in order to take courses in this university. Thirdly, we need to engage and develop our work in medical research and medical education with the University of Warwick. This week, I was delighted to attend a degree ceremony in the University of Warwick, where the first graduates from the Leicester Warwick Medical Schools uh, were presented to their chancellor. And today, I am very pleased to welcome to us the Deputy Vice-Chancellor of the University, Professor Stuart Palmer, and also the Vice Dean of the Warwick Medical School, Professor Yvonne Carter. We are delighted to see you with us as more Leicester Warwick Graduate Schools graduates go through this ceremony. Finally, I think one can begin to speculate as to what kinds of approaches higher education might become involved in. I believe that we need to think about radical ways of delivering education to a whole range of people who otherwise might not receive a higher education or have the time to come to a campus for their professional learning. In that sense, we have engaged in distance education for some years and are now developing online learning, which I hope will move even further in terms of its development with our newly appointed professor of e-learning. 6,000 students study with us by distance learning. So if by any chance this afternoon, parents and friends feel that they will, too would like their University of Leicester degree, can I say, if you care to be signed up at the end of this ceremony, you too can be on your route to another degree ceremony in the De Montfort Hall. But among the things that any university engages in, it cannot do so without the people who work here. And as this is the last degree ceremony this summer, it does seem important to draw attention to all the people who have contributed to the success of the summer degree ceremonies. It is a large operation, as those of you can, in this degree congregation can see, and this is the sixth ceremony this week. I would like to thank all those people who have made a tremendous team effort whether they are in the clerical, administrative, or academic staff, they make a fantastic team to deliver a, a wonderful set of degree ceremonies. There is also one person that I would like to single out in particular this year, and that is one of our public orators, Professor Stuart Peterson, who comes to the end of his three-year tour of duty. Um, 
I'm sure on these occasions we will uh, firstly say thank you very much indeed for all that you have contributed, Professor Peterson, and uh, we shall always be willing to welcome you back to this high office. Before I close this afternoon, I would like to congratulate all those of you who are graduating today and indeed to ask you to join with me in a round of applause for all those people who have supported you through your university education. In particular, your parents, your relatives, your friends, your sponsors. And so I would ask the graduating class of 2004 to join with me in a round of applause. Well, that's very good, but I'm always told that the Faculty of Medicine and Biological Sciences can applaud louder and longer than any other faculty. And I should tell you that the, the length and the volume of applause this year has been something second to none. So you've got your work cut out to, to keep your reputation this afternoon. Have an enjoyable day with us. Applaud your fellow students and all good wishes to you in your future careers. Professor David Bradley is a physician, an epidemiologist, and a zoologist. He was born in Leicester in 1937 and educated at the Wigston School. There he acquired a passion for natural history, fostered by his French teacher, who obtained for him a permit to wander in the university's old botanical garden, then located between the university and the school. From the Wiggy, he went as a scholar to Selwyn College, Cambridge, where he gained a first-class BA in Natural Sciences and then on to University College Medical School in London for his clinical work, graduating Bachelor of Medicine and of Surgery in 1961. He graduated Doctor of Medicine at Oxford in 1972. David Bradley has spent most of his working life with the Ross Institute of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. He lived in East Africa for 10 years Firstly, as medical research officer with the, with the Ross Institute's Bilharzia Research Unit in Tanzania, and then as a lecturer at Makerere University in Uganda. The current vice president of Uganda was one of his students. He returned to this country in 1969 as a Royal Society Research Fellow based in Oxford, where he investigated the genetics of how the body, resi how the body resists leishmaniasis Kala-Azar disease, discovering the mouse gene that decides whether the parasite can infect, and one that discovers recovery, one that determines recovery. He has been director of the Ross Institute and professor of tropical hygiene in the University of London since 1974. David Bradley has worked extensively in the field of waterborne disease. Whilst working in Uganda, he carried out the first comprehensive field study of domestic water use in Africa, defining a new approach to rural water supply and sanitation. His reclassification of waterborne diseases is now universally accepted. He became co-director of the UK Malaria Reference Laboratory in 1974, and for many years led a group carrying out malaria research funded by the Department for International Development. Now to us, in Britain in the 21st century, malaria is now only a problem if we go on holiday to some of the more interesting parts of the world. So long as we take the prescribed pills on advice from the Malaria Reference Laboratory, we hope that all will be well. This was not always the case. Until very recently, malaria was rife in the low-lying parts of England, especially East Anglia, where it was known as the ague, or intermittent fever. Shakespeare mentions the ague in eight of his plays. 
Even in his time, it was recognised as a disease of marshy areas. Thus, in the tempest, Caliban curses his master. All the infections that the sun sucks up from bogs, fens, flats on Prospero fall. The atmosphere of such areas gives the disease its modern name, the Italian malaria, bad air. The death rates from malaria in East Anglia in the late 18th century were very similar to those reported from Nigeria today. Indeed, Oliver Cromwell died of malaria in 1658. A little later, an effective remedy became available, the Jesuit's bark, the bark of the chinchona tree, which was imported from South America. Those of you who are fans of the novels of Patrick O'Brien will know all about Jesuit's bark and other South American drugs. Its active ingredient, quinine, was extracted about 1820 and rapidly became the mainstay of treatment for malaria. Its efficacy also led to the popularity of Indian tonic water, which contains small amounts of quinine. The British sahibs found it a very useful diluent for gin. By the end of the 19th century, the causes of malaria were clear, with the discovery of the mosquito-borne parasites, which are the infective agents. Using this knowledge, malaria was effectively eradicated in England during the first half of the 20th century. But in other parts of the world, malaria remains an intractable problem. About 300 million people worldwide are affected by the disease, and some one million die from it each year mostly children in Africa, although malaria is widespread throughout the tropics. The control of malaria in these areas requires combined measures, as it did in England, but they need to be applied up to a thousand times more effectively. It is necessarily an interdisciplinary effort. The elimination of mosquito habitat, the production and dissemination of insecticide-treated mosquito nets, training in their correct use, plus the development of new drugs are all important parts of a successful malaria control program. David Bradley built up his multidisciplinary group with disciplines ranging from molecular biology to social anthropology at a time when this range was thought to be extraordinary, specifically to tackle these applied problems of public health in poor countries. David Bradley has served on many expert panels on tropical diseases over the years he holds many awards and medals. Appropriately, when we are today conferring degrees in both medicine and in biological sciences, he is both a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians and of the Institute of Biology. We are honored by his being with us today. Mr. Chancellor, on the recommendation of the Senate and of the Council, I present David John Bradley, that you may confer on him the honorary degree of Doctor of Science. I've been to the degree of Dr. Rashad. Welcome to the Monarch. Congratulations. Chancellor, Lord Mayor, Vice-Chancellor and members of the Council, colleagues of all ages, new and old, and guests. I feel quite overwhelmed by the honor that you have done me, which means more to me than I can say. I am very much a local boy. Leicester is where I was born, in fact, about 200 yards from where you are sitting at the moment. And I grew up and was educated at the Wiggy, above all by a Leicester University graduate, George Shield. He was a biologist, a bagpiper, a sculptor of great distinction, later a founder of sixth form colleges, and a truly great teacher who built science into my thinking about biology and ecology, and that had in turn originated from the ponds and woods of southeast Leicestershire and Rutland, where I wandered around on my bicycle, and from my parents. Indeed, my one regret this evening, or this afternoon, is that though they were lifelong citizens of Leicester, they're no longer alive and able to be thanked here for the great sacrifices they made for my education and career. 
However, my wife and those of my children who are not overseas this week are here, and I can thank them for coping with my life overseas and living overseas, and subsequently for the absences needed to continue the work. We were immensely fortunate. We turned up in Tanzania in East Africa on its Independence Day and benefited both from the colonial infrastructure that was around, but also the um, post-colonial independent atmosphere. The day we arrived, I remember clearly, we mingled with the celebrating crowds underneath the coffee cotton exchange in Mwanza. And also that day, I remember curry was served for lunch and I took my fir a mouthful, a large mouthful, of chopped French beans with the curry served at the hotel, a hotel which is known throughout East Africa as the Dysentery Arms. Um, and that was the way I discovered what chili, green chilies are. I ran from the room. Health and medical problems of developing countries are huge, and it's still possible, even now, to find diseases which affect a million people with almost no research literature on them so that one can plunge straight into the problem and where the boundaries between disciplines are almost meaningless and where the results will benefit both rich and poor countries. In the 1970s, there was a delusion in this country that infectious diseases were no longer a problem for rich countries. Since then, CJD, MRSA, and above all, HIV AIDS, have shown the error of that naive view. And the growth of world travel has globalized the issues. Your new department of infection, immunity, and inflammation reflects this realization of the importance of infections everywhere throughout the world today and it needs expertise right through from molecular epidemiology through to anthropology. I recall that work that began with me sitting on a termite hill in the dusk as a bait for biting sand flies in the northwest of Uganda, and I'm afraid it was abandoned when a potentially biting lion decided to join the research team, led me to work on the leishmania parasites that those sandflies transmitted, then to the mouse gene that controlled resistance to leishmaniasis, now sequenced and given um, the name NRAMP, and recently it's been shown to be the gene that affects whether people um, suffer from tuberculosis when they get infected in this country. I'm very fortunate to work in an institution with a staff coming from 40 different nationalities and postgraduates from over 100 countries. This diversity of cultures, as does the diversity which you have in Leicester, gives the broad view of health issues that are needed in a globalizing world. I do commend to you, this, those of you who are medical or working in health fields, this field of medical work, which can combine field biology, clinical medicine, laboratory research, and epidemiology. It's a field that is wide open, where one can make a difference to both science and to the life and health of poor people. And it's also great fun, as science always should be. Thank you again, Chancellor. Graduands in the Faculty of Science will be presented by the Dean, Professor Hillman. Will all graduands in the faculty please stand? Mr. Chancellor, I ask you to admit these candidates from the Faculty of Science 
for the several degrees for which they are presented. Graduate of the Faculty of Science, by the authority of the Senate, I admit you to the several degrees which you are presented. For the degree of Doctor of Philosophy, Simon Good. I think you read Doctor of Philosophy and congratulations. Alexander Hans. I think you read Doctor of Philosophy and congratulations. David Smith. I think you read Doctor of Philosophy and congratulations. The degree of Master of Physics in Physics, winner of the Departmental Prize in Physics and Astronomy and the Faculty Prize, Ismail Hassanov. Congratulations, well done on your prize. Where are you going after this? Thank you. Good. Congratulations. Halim Kuzumat Major. Congratulations. For the degree of Master of Physics in Physics with Astrophysics, Daniel Brooks. Congratulations. Well done. Cara Edwards. Congratulations. Winner of the Departmental Prize in Physics and Astronomy, the Raymond Hyde Prize, and the Veland Scholarship, Rianne Evans. Cheryl Herkett. Congratulations. Nicholas Johnson. Congratulations. Rosalind Whiffen. Congratulations. For the degree of Master of Physics in Physics with Space Science and Technology, Colin Burrett. Congratulations. Winner of the Departmental Bursary, Sarah Casewell. Congratulations. Well done. Congratulations. Simon Corn. Congratulations. Winner of the Departmental Scholarship, Philip Cripps. Well done, congratulations on your scholarship. Ioannis Grout. Congratulations. Peter Hammond. Congratulations. Daniel Henwood. Congratulations. Winner of the Space Center Scholarship, Robin Hughes. <laughs> Winner of the Departmental Bursary and the Departmental Prize in Physics and Astronomy, Duncan Levitt. Well done, congratulations on your prize. Well done. Benjamin Mannerings. Congratulations. Adrian Martindale. Congratulations. Joanna O'Rourke. Congratulations. David Ridley. Congratulations. Philip Smith. Congratulations. Richard Tucker. For the degree of Master of Physics in Physics with Space Science and Technology with a semester in Australia, Sarah Badman. Congratulations. Catherine Maloney. Congratulations. For the degree of Bachelor of Science in Physics, Alam Al-Siabi. 
Congratulations, well done. Charles Durden. Congratulations. Christopher Kerwin. Congratulations. Paul Meller. Congratulations. Bina Varki. Congratulations. Susan Varki. Congratulations. Christopher Wilson. Congratulations. For the degree of Bachelor of Science in Physics with Astrophysics, David Black. Paul Chimba. Shelley Dudley. Nicola Hay. John Jervis. Adam Jewell. Peter Lorenk. Elizabeth Smith. Peter Stevenson. Andrew Wilson. For the degree of Bachelor of Science in Physics with Space Science and Technology, Christopher Beedling. William Blewett. Lewis Delaney. Richard Farley. David Gregory. Alex Head. Daniel Hyman. Victoria Nichols. Dean Riley. Brian Robinson. Adam Shale. Michael Shields. Winner of the departmental bursary, Colin Walder. Helen Watkinson. For the degree of Bachelor of Science in Physics with Medical Physics, Joseph McAndrews. Karen Paddison. Bavish Ravat. Mary Yip. Mr. Chancellor, I ask you to admit for the several degrees for which they are present by my presented by my faculty those candidates who are absent. By the authority of the Senate, I admit those candidates who are absent to the several degrees which they are presented. The graduands in the Faculty of Medicine and Biological Sciences will be presented by the Dean, Professor Lauder. Will all graduands in the faculty please stand? Mr. Chancellor, I ask you to admit these candidates from the Faculty of Medicine and Biological Sciences to the several degrees for which they are presented. Graduates of the Faculty of Medicine and Biological Sciences, 
by the authority of the Senate, I admit you to the several degrees which you are presented. for the degree of Doctor of Medicine, Anthony Clover. I need the degree of Doctor of Medicine, congratulations. Paul Hayes. I need the degree of Doctor of Medicine, congratulations. Sunjay Jain. I need the degree of Doctor of Medicine, congratulations. Andrew Lewington. Alexander Ung. Ravi Pathmanatha. Stephen Shepherd. Christopher Sutton. Benjamin Swift. Daniel Swinson. For the degree of Doctor of Philosophy, Mark Anderton. Jennifer Calvert. Elaine Corcoran. Andusha Durbury. Craig Griffin. David Hughes. Sonia Jackson. Emma Johnson. Karinjit Kuna. Mark Lambert. Hanan Messia. Becky Pickering. Jonathan Rock. Tim Slingsby. Jima Stanton. Sukwinda Tandy. Samantha Tull. Sheridan Waldron. For the degree of Master of Research, Farah Kawaja. For the degree of Master of Arts in Child Welfare Studies, Gillian Wheeler. For the degree of Master of Arts in Social Work, Shainaz Alana. Lee Anis. Kuldeep Bal. Kamaljeet Baku, Joanna Bradley, Mark Brooks, Sheila Butler, Benjamin Ensom, Damien Fitzpatrick, 
Sharif Haider, John Harrison, Jaskarin Callaray, Gareth Leckie, Maxine Letham, Andrew McTaggart, Catherine Singleton, Michelle Taylor, Sarah Towers, Natasha Weir, Nicola Wells. For the degree of Master of Science in Bioinformatics, Rebecca Crook. Amy Openshaw. For the degree of Master of Science in Clinical Sciences, Jafaru Abu. Darian Hoyan Chung. For the degree of Master of Science in Pain Management, David Baham. Gillian Davis. Reginda Dial. Jacqueline Hugh. Julie Hughes. Carolyn Nation. Elizabeth Richardson, Lorraine Robinson, Robert Stenner, for the degree of Bachelor of Sciences in Biological Sciences, Faria Ahmad, Alison Albins. David Ansley, Adele Antcliffe, Gurpurit Bakra, Matthew Ball, Catherine Barnes, Felicia Beckley. Robert Bell, Natalie Bibb, winner of the Aventus Prize, Eve Bokes, Hannah Boniface, Serene Carty. Ian Cheeseman, Letitia Chen, Karamjit Chara, Samyami Chowdhury, Emma Clark, Luke Clayton. Ben Coomer, Karen Crockett. The winner of the Physiological Society Undergraduate Prize, Claire Cunningham. Sami El Hakiam. The winner of the AstraZeneca Physiology and Pharmacology Prize, Abby Fairs. Gemma Finch. Owen Flack. Victoria Fretwell. Alistair Fryatt. George Gardner. Sarah Gay, 
Carly Grandage, Danica Greenberg, Saeed Hafid, Selena Halliday, Anika Harrington, Lynn Harris, Anna Hartridge, Rebecca Higgs, Alastair Hilton, Robert Holbrook, Ijeome Igumi, Kimberly Johnson, Emma Jones, Naila Khan, Yi Wen Kong, Kiran Kundi, William Law, Francis Laws, Nicola Layton, Diana Lynch, Rena Madvani, Holly Margerison, Lucy Martin, Andrew May, the winner of the Margaret Wallace Henry Prize, Stephen Meader. Well, Andrew Melia. Claire Melling. The winner of the Alfred Pomeranz Prize, Katie Millward. Well, <laughs> Zanknar Mystery. The winner of the AstraZeneca Prize, Charlotte Otway. Well, Edward Althwaite. Elizabeth Owen. Justin Patel, Prajay Patel, Sarah Peak, Charlotte Pierce, Benjamin Pettit, Robert Pitsy. Julia Quick, Rachel Quinn, Rima Rahman, Ivan Ratre, Matthew Rawlings, Rupinda Sahota, Catherine Sanders, Navinda Sanger, Deepa Sarman, Emily Searle, Louise Shaw, Daniel Smallwood, 
Natalie Stevenson, Sophie Stradford, Rajni Sudhir, Julie Sutcliffe, Paul Tamblin, Andrew Thompson, Tina Vaghila, Hannah Van Lint, Samantha Warrington, Joanna Williams, Teresa Witz, Lee Wodka, Stephen Woods. For the degree of Bachelor of Science in Biological Sciences European Union, Mark Fye. Amanda Kent Smith. For the degree of Bachelor of Science in Medical Biochemistry, Bushra Anwar. Uzma Asgar. Sherbani Ashra. Bianca Bond. Ruth Cowie. James Crawford. Camille Dole. Daniel Evans. Kate Evans, Daniel Fleet, Jordan Gold, Natasha Johnston, Flora Kadachum, Isabel Martin, Fazila Mulvey, Claire Moore, Sakila Mwambingu, Robert Ricks, Stephanie Williams. For the degree of Bachelor of Science in Medical Biochemistry Sandwich, and also the winner of the Medical Biochemistry Prize and the Novartis Best Student in the Third Year Pharmacology Prize, Ashfaq Gumra. <laughs> the winner of the Departmental Undergraduate Prize, Eve Royal. <laughs> Master of Science in Bioinformatics, Simran Khori. Professor Sir Alec Jeffreys is one of the most distinguished geneticists of this age. A mere glance at his curriculum vitae is enough to shatter the ego of most fellow scientists. He's credited with a range of major discoveries, became a fellow of the Royal Society in his 30s, and was knighted in his 40s. Yet still he remains an essentially modest man, wedded to his laboratory and the continuing pursuit of scientific excellence. If there were ever a natural-born scientist, Alec is one. He grew up in modest circumstances in Oxford and Luton, and inspired by his father, an inveterate inventor, became fascinated by science at a tender age. The gift of a potentially lethal chemistry set at the age of eight set him off on a life of experimental science. 
his natural curiosity drove him rapidly to experiments that would make a health and safety inspector's hair curl. Having alarmed the local population by carrying home on the bus a leaking bottle of fuming nitric acid, another gift of a microscope this time kindled an interest in the safer territory of biology. The combination of biology and chemistry has driven his scientific career ever since. By the time he reached his local grammar school, Alec was already an accomplished scientist. Teachers in other subjects were not necessarily so impressed. Having exasperated his Latin master with the school's worst ever performance in a mock exam, however, Alec decided to demonstrate the breadth of his brilliance, applied himself, and went on to win the school prize in that as well. He returned to science A-levels in Britain's first ever sixth form college, and in recognition of his skill, was given free reign in the school laboratories, as near to heaven as he could achieve at that stage in his life. Progress to Oxford to read biochemistry was guaranteed. Initially put off by some of the drier aspects, he rapidly discovered genetics. Attracted by the logic of the subject, he saw immediately the potential of the developing field of molecular biology and decided to opt for a PhD on mitochondrial genetics at the Oxford Genetics Laboratory. His supervisor, a junior lecturer at the time, realized that the lightest touch was required and left Alec to his own devices with just the occasional application of the brakes to keep him on course. A wise decision indeed, as the first papers stormed into the scientific literature within a matter of months. A chance meeting in a lunch queue alerted Alec to the techniques of DNA analysis that have formed the basis of his subsequent career. He left Oxford on a prestigious European Molecular Biology Fellowship to work in Holland and began the study of globin genes. Within a very short time, major discoveries followed and were reported in a series of publications in the most prestigious journals. In 1977, he moved to the University of Leicester, where he's remained. He found himself in a supportive and facilitative environment where he was trusted to follow his instincts and get on with it. Within a short time, he was appointed to the Lister Fellowship Scheme, which allowed him to concentrate solely on research by providing cover for his teaching and other responsibilities. His time at the laboratory bench proved exceptionally fruitful. A chance observation stimulate him, stimulated him to studies which revealed hypervariable regions of DNA, the basis of the genetic fingerprinting techniques for which he is now so famous. In reality, this discovery, though of enormous impact, is only one of Alec's achievements. Others, such as the discovery of copy genes, split genes, and pseudogenes, are of comparable or greater scientific importance. Already marked as one of the greats, he was elected a Fellow of the Royal Society at the exceptionally early age of 36, and within a short time appointed a Royal Society Wolfson Research Professor which guaranteed for life his freedom at the laboratory bench, the place he's most happy. Alec has always been content to lead a small, focused research group so that he stays in touch with the realities of the science rather than being drawn too far into the politics of the scientific community. It has been for others to build a huge industry out of his discoveries, which have revolutionized the detection of crime and so many other aspects of our lives. Alec is driven to communicate his passion for science to the public. He undertakes an arduous program of lectures to a huge variety of groups, enjoying in particular lecturing to groups of school children that he aims to inspire to become the scientists of the future. His contributions have been recognized with a knighthood in 1994, and a raft of other honors sufficient to fill a very large display. Earlier this year, he received the Louis Jante Prize, one of the most prestigious scientific awards there is. Professor Sir Alec Jeffries is a man with genes in his science and science in his genes. As close to the ideal of a pure scientist that it's possible to get, he's shown convincingly that the pursuit of science for its own sake 
can have incalculable benefits for mankind as a whole. Mr Chancellor, on the recommendation of the Senate and the Council, I present to you Alec Jeffreys, that you may confer upon him the honorary degree of Doctor of Science. Chancellor, Vice-Chancellor, Lord Mayor, graduates, ladies and gentlemen, you've all done me an enormous honour today and it's with huge pleasure that I accept this honorary doctorate and not just for myself but for all my friends and colleagues at Leicester who over the years have contributed so much to our work in genetics. And time doesn't me permit me to go through the entire list but I'll just pick out three. The first is Bob Pritchard a truly brilliant geneticist who founded the Department of Genetics here at Leicester and created a great department and a wonderful atmosphere of total academic freedom that proved essential in our development of our work on DNA fingerprinting. I'd also like to thank my technician of the time, Vicky Wilson, who saved DNA fingerprinting by rescuing a key ingredient of the technology that in a fit of peak I'd thrown into the bin and she said, no, Alec, not a bright idea, and she rescued it. And I'd also like to say a huge thank you to, to my wife, Sue, who's here today, who has been a tremendous support over the years to me, but also played a very important role in DNA fingerprinting. It was she who spotted the first big application of DNA fingerprinting, and that is reuniting families who have been disrupted by immigration disputes. That, in fact, proved to be the first mass application of DNA fingerprinting. Now, I do take a great deal of pride in our work, and especially in the attention and connection that it has with Leicester. I've been to the States on many occasions, and I take enormous pleasure in telling heaven knows how many Americans I do not live in a city that is called Leicester. Okay. <laughs> the only problem I've ever hit in the States was on one occasion where I was being interviewed live on primetime TV, and they threw a very interesting question at me, and that is, if genetic fingerprinting is so great, why wasn't it invented in America? Now, I'm still racking my brains as a suitable and polite answer to that and have yet to come up with one. Now, I have to say I'm just amazed at how technology, which is now 20 years old, has reached out right around the world and directly touched the lives of millions of people now. Just in the UK, our police have a national database of criminals and suspects, which now totals 2.5 million people. That's about one person in 25 of the population which by the law of averages means there should be a considerable number of database people here in this hall. But I'll save you embarrassment, and unless you want to, uh, do not show your hands. Now, as you've heard, our work has actually received, I think, far more than its fair share of recognition. Though I have to say that this honorary doctorate from my own university is very, very, very special to me indeed. I really can't tell you how important it is to me. I'd also like to thank the orator for splendidly summarising uh, the work that we've done over the years. And I have to say it's an awful lot more comprehensible than an honorary degree that I've recently received from Oxford, where the oration was entirely in Latin, and it finished with a comment, and I quote from a translation, that my work had, and I quote, followed the injunction of Apollo at Delphi by working on the question of what it is to be human and by giving the great part of the answer, which I have to say completely gobsmacked me. I thought I was a biologist, <laughs> but uh, there you go. So thank you to the orator. And I'd just like to finish by congratulating all you graduates and graduates here today. You're the heroes of today, not me. I shouldn't be here. You're the important people. And I'm sure, like me, you're all enormously proud, not just to be part of this great university, but to have played a terribly important part in the life of this wonderful university. I thank you all very much.
The remaining graduands in the Faculty of Medicine and Biological Sciences will now be presented by the Dean, Professor Lauder. Mr. Vice-Chancellor, for the degree of Bachelor of Science in Medical Genetics, Amit Amin. Amira Ashmoy. Alan Baker. Pamela Barker. Andrew Burles. Nizar Drew. Charles Edwards, Janet Reynolds, Sarah Griffiths, Abdel Halim, Salina Jane, Tina Johns, Yasmin Khan, Nita Lakani. Philip Leonard, Daniel North, Farah Pathan, Zoe Reeson, Samantha Rowe, Robert Southern, Becky Speak. Jennifer Spriggs, Joanne Swan, Chun Xiong Tan, Yok Weng Tan, Kate Temple, Madeline Venables. For the intercalated degree of Bachelor of Science, Sarah Alderson. The winner of the Charles Lawson Bursary for Intercalated Studies, James Alex. Esty Serbenskate. Spiridon Ganatus. Christopher Hebbs. Emily Johnson, Richard Kitchen, Matthew Langtree, Emma Louise Long, Ilios Nikopoulos, Craig Sheridan, Catherine Sherwin, Kate Weller, Thomas Welsh, for the degrees of Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery, Nanda Bhatt, Adam Chesters, The winner of the Medical Women's Federation East Midlands Prize, Caroline Connolly. Philip Dykes. Bernadette Lupton. Amy Needham. Caroline Rickard. Upcast Sara, Kirsten Schmidt, Emma Seisland, Shilpi Soren, Lydia Walsh, Arma Ahmed, Sohab Ahmed. Tazid Hassan, Mark Ainsley, 
Congratulations. Rashed Akhtar. Congratulations. Rachel Alexander. Congratulations. Maksudal Ali. Congratulations. Rebecca Alsop. Congratulations. The winner of the Keeler Prize, Kasi Ahmadi. Congratulations. Well done on your prize. Hannah Arbery. Congratulations. Paul Arkless. Congratulations. Nicholas Arnold. Congratulations. Mohammed As Sultani. Congratulations. Jaswant Badhisha. Congratulations. Sarah Bailey. Congratulations. Pratik Basu. Olivia Bailey. Congratulations, Baba. Sophina Begum. Congratulations. Rebecca Belfit. Congratulations. Neha Batnaga. Congratulations. Akib Bharti. Congratulations. Helen Boo. Congratulations. Pamela Boyer. Congratulations. Elizabeth Bright. Congratulations. Rachel Brindle. Congratulations. David Broodbank. Congratulations. Lisa Brown. Congratulations. Gemma Burford. Congratulations. Nicholas Butler. Congratulations. Kisham Butt. Congratulations. Thank you. Angela Carruthers. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Winner of the elective prize, Ashish Chowdhury. Congratulations. Well done on your prize. Titsi Chawatama. Congratulations. Well done. Victoria Cooper. Congratulations. The winner of the Pfizer Prize and the John McVicker Prize and Medal, James Cowdery. Peter Cranefield. Congratulations. Adam Crowther. Congratulations. David Kundal. Congratulations. Hannah Dale. Congratulations. Well done. Victoria Deans. Congratulations. Paramjit Diol. Congratulations. Helen Dillon. Alastair Doyley. Congratulations. Honey El Matal. Congratulations. Rebecca Evans. Congratulations. Scott Evans. Congratulations. James Fagg. Congratulations. Winner of the elective prize, Nicola Felton. Congratulations. Well done on your prize. Winner of the BMA Prize for Clinical Excellence, Jamie Ferguson. Congratulations, well done on your prize. James Fleet. Congratulations. Laura Florence. Congratulations. Christina Frost. Congratulations. Sandeep Ghosh. Congratulations. Amy Gibbon. Congratulations, Father. Rebecca Giles. Congratulations. Nicholas Gill. Congratulations. Charles Goss. Congratulations. Melissa Gray. Congratulations, Father. James Hankinson. Congratulations. Kate Haskins. Congratulations. Mandy Peer. Congratulations. Chris Hill. Congratulations. Olivia Ho. Congratulations. Victoria Howell. Congratulations. Michelle Huey. Congratulations. Shahab Hussein. Congratulations. 
Safiya Imtiaz. Benjamin Jackson. Melanie Jarman. Elizabeth Jenkins. Lisa Jenkins. Mark Jeske. The winner of the Carl Zeiss Prize and the Sir Robert Kilpatrick Prize, Christine Johnson. Tara Kidd. Daniel Komroa. Rohit Kumar. Kirsty Lachlan. Sarah Lord. Muninda Lotte. A. Marluin. Richard Mayer. Paniotis Macridis. Nasser Malik. The winner of the Sydney Brandon Prize and Medal in Psychiatry, the Faculty of Medicine Gold Medal, the Charles Lawson Prize, and the BMA Prize, Christopher Mann. Elizabeth Marfleet. Congratulations, well done. Helen Maxwell Jones. Congratulations. Sarah Merriman. Congratulations. Ismail Mohammed. Congratulations. Yara Mohammed. Congratulations. Thank you. Penelope Morgan. Congratulations. Tama Morton Jones. Saqib Mughal. Congratulations. Megan Murdoch. Congratulations. Novanil Nandi. Congratulations. Abda Noreen. Congratulations. Catherine O'Brien. Congratulations. Kevin Owusu Ansa. Congratulations. Raj Pal. Congratulations. Sri Panditi. Congratulations. The winner of the Roche Pharmaceuticals Prize, Tabitha Parsons. Congratulations. Shaquille Patel. Congratulations. Nishil Patel. Congratulations. Ruth Pearson. Congratulations. Well done. The winner of the Smith Klein and French Prize, Christina Perry. Congratulations. Emily Poole. Congratulations, thank you. Melanie Poole. Congratulations. Ben Pope. Congratulations. Rosemary Potts. Congratulations, brother. Benjamin Pruden. Congratulations. Nishat Karma. Congratulations. Mushfikur Rahman. Congratulations. Sharu Ramli. Congratulations. Deepa Ratahali. Congratulations. Nicholas Rhodes. Congratulations. Lucy Roche. Congratulations. Jennifer Rowley. Congratulations. Louise Ryan. Congratulations. Atul Sachdeva. Congratulations. Alexander Scott. Congratulations. Thomas Selms. Congratulations. Mark Shafu. Congratulations. Well Deepti Shah. Congratulations. Dave Sharma. Congratulations. Gorda Shelley Fraser. Congratulations. Graham Simpson. Congratulations, Father. 
Catherine Sims. Congratulations. Arika Singh. Congratulations. Joanna Skelton. Congratulations, brother. Rebecca Smith. Congratulations. Catherine Snook. Congratulations. Jill Spencer. Congratulations. Georgina Standen. Congratulations, brother. James Stevenson. Congratulations. Kevin Stewart. Congratulations. Kevin Tan. Congratulations. Catherine Taylor. Congratulations. Victoria Taylor. Congratulations. Matthew Sang. Congratulations. Jessica Turner. Congratulations. Eleanor Turpin. Congratulations. Aklaki Udin. Congratulations. Luke Panessa Udin. Congratulations. Narvin Venkatraman. Congratulations. Anupam Verma. Congratulations. The winner of the Tressida Prize, Anna Wardle. Congratulations, and well done on the prize. Charlotte Watson. Congratulations. The winner of the Roche Pharmaceuticals Prize, James Weaver. Congratulations, and well done on your prize. Deborah Webb. Congratulations. Louise Welsh. Congratulations. Charlotte White. Congratulations. The winner of the Smith Klein and French Prize, Louise White. Congratulations, Madame on your prize. Winner of the elective prize, Amy Whitaker. Congratulations, and well done on your prize. Thank you. Ashley Wilson. Congratulations. George Winder. Congratulations. Claire Winterbottom. Congratulations. James Woodard. The winner of the AstraZeneca Prize, Gavin Wooldridge. Congratulations and well done on your prize. Richard Wright. Congratulations. Rizwan Yacoub. Mr. Vice-Chancellor, I ask you to admit to the several degrees for which they are presented by my faculty those candidates who are absent. By the authority of the Senate, I admit those candidates who are absent to the several degrees for which they are presented. Mr. Vice-Chancellor, I now invite a representative of those whom you have admitted today to the degrees of Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery to come forward to the platform in order that she may lead them in the affirmation of the Declaration of Geneva. Will graduates in the degrees of Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery please stand? Please declare with me, at the time of being admitted as a member of the medical profession, I solemnly pledge myself to consecrate my life to the service of humanity. I will give to my teachers the respect and gratitude which is their due. I will practice my profession with conscience and dignity. The health of my patients will be my first consideration. I will respect the secrets Charing confided in me, even after the patient has died. I will maintain by all means in my power the honour and the noble traditions of the medical profession. 
My colleagues will be my brothers and my sisters. I will not commit consideration of religion, nationality, race, politics, or social standing to intervene between my duty and patience. I will maintain the utmost respect for human life from its beginning, even under threat, and I will not use my medical knowledge contrary to the laws of humanity. I make these promises solemnly, freely, and upon my honour. Before I begin, could I just say, I think you are the clear winners of the Vice-Chancellor's Prize for the loudest applause. <laughs> so let me congratulate our honorary graduates and say how pleased we are they found time to join us for this ceremony, giving the younger ones amongst you an indication of the exciting things you might aspire to in later life. All the rest of you have had to earn your degrees the quick way, just working hard and passing exams. I congratulate you all and all those behind you, the parents, teachers, friends, who have helped you to get to this stage. It is a little over 50 years since I myself graduated, and half a century is a substantial slice of history. Much has happened in that time, in politics, economics, science and technology. Old empires faded away, the Cold War emerged with its threatening arms race, eventually ending with the collapse of the Berlin Wall. New technology changed our lives, television, computers, the internet, DNA, the human genome. What will happen in the next 50 years, in the lifetime of the younger members here? There are three kinds of answer one can give to this question. One, we do not know. Two, you will find out. Three, it depends on you. The future is only partly predetermined. Much will depend on your generation. You all have a responsibility for yourselves, your family, society, and mankind as a whole. Having started down this historical route, let me take you back a little further to England in the 17th century, the age of Isaac Newton and the dawn of modern science. In 1698, Peter the Great, Tsar of Russia, spent several months in England studying shipbuilding and navigation, tutored by Edmund Halley, the astronomer who predicted the famous comet that bears his name. Peter the Great also took back with him to Russia many mathematicians, engineers, doctors, and naval officers as part of his grand design of modernizing Russia. Incidentally, it is said he went around the dockyards disguised as a common sailor, but since he was a giant of a man fully two meters tall, the disguise must have been a thin one. Now, why am I recounting this piece of ancient history? because despite all the differences, it is still relevant for our time. Now it is not Russia, but China, that is in a hurry to modernize itself. It is doubtful if sending the Chinese leader to London for several months in the dockyards would now be the right solution. Instead, China sensibly sent over its students. At the latest count, there were 35,000 students at British universities from mainland China, and the figures are expected to rise rapidly. Now, while I have singled out China as the most dramatic example, it is, of course, part of a much bigger picture. Students from India, East Asia, and other parts of the world have been coming here in ever-increasing numbers. They come for a variety of purposes, but they will return to modernize their countries. And it is not, not only governments that send or finance these students. Many come with their own resources, supported by their families, who appreciate the advantages of higher education. As you may know, and as the Vice-Chancellor usually reminds us, Leicester has been in the forefront of the provision of education for foreign students. Moreover, modern communications, not available in the time of Peter the Great, mean that the university can now go to the student rather than the other way around. Just think what Peter the Great would have achieved if he'd had email. 
So how does this little historical digression help us peer into the next 50 years? First of all, we see the impending rise of China and India with their vast populations and their dramatic economic growth. I've been to both countries frequently in the past few years and can assure you the figures do not lie. Nearer home, and with less fanfare, the steady enlargement of the European Union is certainly a historic event whose real significance is underplayed in this country. Turning from politics and economics to science and technology, we are all expecting great things from the application of molecular biology to medicine. You may all live much longer, perhaps long enough to come back to Leicester for a further degree in, say, the year 2050. Other changes will come from scientific discoveries that are not yet on the horizon. Science may surpass science fiction. Unfortunately, the future is not all rosy. Climate change threatens us all, and is, in the words of Sir David King, the government's chief scientific advisor, a greater danger than terrorism. You, the younger generation, have to persuade your political leaders of the truth of this statement. There are also serious problems with local problems with global implications. Many of them, I regret to say, residues of the British Empire. I once listed four of these in historical order. Ireland, South Africa, Palestine, Kashmir. And of these seemingly intractable problems, there has been progress on three, leaving only that of Palestine with its infamous war. I hope that your generation will see a just and peaceful resolution of all of them. Finally, as we look from the 20th to the 21st century, we should recognize the remarkable way in which the English language has become an almost universal medium of discourse. Science and business at an international level are increasingly conducted in English, a fact which, of course, makes a university degree from this country particularly valuable. And it seems unlikely this will change, though, as a precaution, you might like to brush up on your Mandarin. I hope I have not scared you off the next 50 years. Whatever happens, your Leicester education should stand you in good stead. You will have acquired skills, you will have learned to think clearly and argue rationally. You will have had contact with students from other cultures and other backgrounds. You will need to be adaptable, and you may well spend time working and living in foreign countries. The modern world has few borders. I wish you all every success. I now declare this congregation closed.